introduction there reminds us there are lots of ways to say thank you uh, and we should seek uh, as Christians to employ them all as we give our thanks to the Lord uh, and especially this gift of speech that God has given us uh, to, to say thank you we're going to be talking about that uh, this morning and I just want to fill you in on a couple of things that uh, uh, we've got coming uh, along on our calendar as we as we reopen gradually of course this next or this Wednesday night uh, we are going to begin uh, Awana and Refuge uh, and our adult Bible study. I know some have asked about that because we haven't really emphasized that. Yes, all of that, uh, just a normal Wednesday night schedule. With this exception, we're only going to go from 6.30 to 7.30 uh, in initially, uh, and we'll expand when we, uh, when we feel like we're ready to do that. Brother James, uh, that means that Refuge is actually going to start at 6.30. Really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I usually let them play for 30 minutes, but we're going to eliminate the playing, so we're going to start at 6.30. Okay, all right. That means we're going to start at 6.30 with Refuge and, uh, and Awana as well in our adult Bible study. And then I want to make you aware that uh, we have plans currently uh, to begin uh, adult and, well, I guess Sunday school throughout, uh, beginning the first Sunday in December. That's when the winter quarter begins, and so we have uh, set that date, uh, which I don't even know what the date is, but the first Sunday in December uh, to begin Sunday school uh, again. Uh, so pray that all of this continues to go well, that our numbers uh, continue to decline. Uh, and praise the Lord, still, we have not had uh, anyone uh, in our congregation that has been diagnosed, at least to my knowledge, uh, with COVID-19. So we thank the Lord for that. Continue to pray for that. All right, let me pray with you, and we'll get started. Yeah, that's, that's worthy of applause. Father, we are grateful today, thankful, and we want you to know that uh, our desire is to be a people who are characterized by gratitude, thanksgiving, uh, satisfaction uh, with who you are and with what you have done and are doing in our lives. And we are thankful this morning, Father, for the way that you have protected this congregation uh, from the coronavirus. And we ask you to continue to do that. And Lord, we ask you to bless um, our reopening, Lord. Uh, and uh, again, continue to speak to the hearts of people Lord, about coming back to church, uh, I pray that you would do that. Uh, we lift up our, our president and first lady this morning, Lord. We pray for their uh, continued uh, recovery from the coronavirus and ask you just to continue to bless our nation, Father. What an important year this is. And I, I pray that, uh, Lord, that, that you would just reign supreme, Father, uh, over the decisions that are made. Uh, by the people of the United States of America. And Lord, today, as always, we pray that you would bless our service. Help us, Lord, to, to be encouraged as we sing and, and as we share around your word. And uh, Lord, we just want you to know how much we love you. We're so thankful for your love for us. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand, please? We are going to give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Amen? Amen.
who is worthy of all of our honor, glory, all power, all majesty. He needs to be exalted and lifted up. We want you to sing how great is our God with us this morning. Amen. The splendor of the King He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice And trembles at his voice How great is our God Say with me how
Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you that we serve a great, great God. We thank you that you are a God that uh, no matter our circumstances, you are better and you are greater. Um, Father, I am so grateful for this church. I'm so grateful for these kids, Lord, as we learn more about you and dive into your scriptures, God. May you illuminate that in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. One of the things I meant to share with you this morning that I hope you will also pray about uh, is uh, the Harris family, uh, Margie Veal, uh, Susan Harris's mom, Mike's mother-in-law, uh, has been battling cancer for months now, and uh, they made the decision a little while back to just suspend any kind of treatment. She just wasn't uh, doing well with them. And uh, from everything that we can tell, she is very near going home to be with the Lord. So pray for uh, the Harris family as they uh, sit with her and minister to her during these uh, presumably last hours of, of her life. I got to, got to pray with her yesterday and she, she couldn't really talk to me. So anyway, it's uh, probably not going to be long, so please be in prayer for them. And if you have your Bibles, Let's turn to Psalm 107. We began our series, Give Thanks, uh, with an introductory look uh, at uh, what Thanksgiving is really all about, what it means to give thanks or to be grateful. Uh, and uh, we kind of focused in on a portion, the first portion of Psalm 103. Uh, the remaining messages of our series will be taken from Psalm 107. So if you kind of want to make that your devotional reading for the next uh, several weeks, that would be a wonderful thing to do. I think help you as we, as we work our way through this text. This morning we're going to look at the first three verses. And I just want to go ahead and read them uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start uh, our discussion uh, about what these verses should speak to our hearts. Psalm 107, verses 1, 2, and 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble, and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let me pray with you. Father, we are so thankful today for the encouragement and really the example that we see throughout Scripture of just what it means to be a person who gives thanks, a person who rightly recognizes that the gifts and the blessings that are ours come from you, uh, and therefore we should direct our praise, our thanks uh, to you. Uh, and, and I pray that you would help us to do that, not only today, Father, but over the course of the next several weeks, Lord, help us to truly become a people who regularly, daily, give thanks, who eagerly and readily give thanks, who are unafraid 
to speak up, uh, not only here in church, uh, but wherever we may be, uh, to direct our praise and our, our appreciation to you, the, the source of every good and perfect gift. So Lord, uh, again, we're praying that you would just do a work in our hearts. I ask you to do a work in my heart. Lord, help me to be a man who is truly thankful, Lord, uh, always and forever for you and for all that you've done for me. Uh, and we will give you thanks and praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, unlike Psalm 103, which we pointed out was really David's personal plea to himself. Uh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, he said, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. This, this psalm is uh, really a call to the congregation of Israel, a call mm -hmm. to the people of God who are gathered to lift up their voices and to corporately praise the Lord. And that's how we need to view it today. Uh, if you ever wonder why we emphasize and begin our services with music, with song, it, it's because we are commanded to do so. Uh, we are to praise the Lord. We are, to, we are to lift our voice as the congregation of God. We're to give thanks and praise. We are to acknowledge God for who He is, for the mighty works that He has done. That's what these initial words in this psalm truly mean. Oh, give thanks. Those words speak of this corporate acknowledgement of gratitude mm -hmm. to the Lord for all that he is and all that he has done. As a matter of fact, we won't get to it for some time now, but in verse 32 of Psalm 107, this thought is really very clearly expressed where, where the psalmist writes, let them, all right, you notice the plural there, again, referring to the people of God, let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of of the elders. So again, these words, congregation, assembly, uh, point to this corporate aspect or corporate significance of our singing and expressing our thanks to God, the giver, as I have already mentioned, uh, of every good and perfect gift. It's, a, it's just a, it's a wonderful, I mean, it's a wonderful thing to express your thanks to God privately, personally. We should, of course, we should do that. But, but the emphasis this morning and, and really throughout this psalm is on this <laughs> corporate aspect. There's just something wonderful mm -hmm. that takes place when the people of God gather together and lift their voices in unison uh, to express their praise and thanksgiving to God. And of course, this psalm, and uh, again, we, I think we always need to be reminded of this, this psalm, like all the, all the other psalms, is a song. These are, these are songs. We're, we're reading the lyrics that David penned that were to be sung by the people uh, of God. Uh, again, as a congregation, either as they gathered for worship or as they were gathering. Of course, I shared with you that some of the songs, and they're the songs of ascent, uh, were songs that were sung by the pilgrims as they traveled from their homes to the temple uh, to, to honor and to, to worship the Lord. So again, this, like all the rest, is a, is a song, a song that was meant to be sung by the congregation of Israel. And, and also, like Psalm 126 that I preached just a few weeks ago, this psalm is also a psalm that commemorates the restoration of Israel from Babylonian captivity. That's what was in the heart and the mind of the psalmist as he, as he writes uh, this deliverance from slavery, this this. Uh, unbelievable, uh, astonishing, aw awesome thing that God had done and was continuing to do uh, in their lives. And, and, and so again, this psalm, like, like other psalms, were written in order to be sung, first and foremost, uh, in worship. All right. When the people of God gathered together to worship God, First Chronicles chapter twenty-three, verses thirty and thirty-one instructed the Levitical priests, okay, who led worship in in the days that the psalm was written. They were to stand every morning, thanking and praising the Lord, and likewise at evening. And then that verse continues. And whenever burnt offerings were offered to the Lord on Sabbaths, new moons, feast days regularly before the Lord. So again, the idea here that was in the mind of the people of God who would initially read and sing this psalm, initially was in the mind of the psalmist himself, 
was this, again, corporate worship that was to be done, engaged in, on a regular basis. It wasn't just every now and then, but it was morning and evening and times of offering and times of festivals and new moons. It was, it was something that was to be done on a regular basis. And so we all get the idea here of what is being expressed. So these were songs. This is a song that was to be sung by the congregation. And it calls the congregation to praise God, to thank Him in a corporate way. What's interesting is that songs like this were also sung during times of war. Uh, we, we read about that in the Old Testament. I don't know that we so often think about it. So I, I guess what we need to understand is this. Not only is it important and appropriate uh, for us to gather together and to sing psalms of praise here in our corporate worship, but it's also important for us to sing in times when trouble confronts us. Uh, singing helps to remind us of who God is and just how powerful He is and how personally involved He is in our lives, uh, especially during times when trouble surrounds us. In, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15, Jehoshaphat, and all of us are familiar with the story of Jehoshaphat, uh, he, he is encouraged as he prepares to go into battle with these words. The Lord speaks to him and says, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde. In other words, Jehoshaphat knew that he was going into battle against a power that was much greater than his own. And, and that's the same thing that we face, isn't it? Often we enter into struggles against enemies or circumstances or situations that at first glance appear to be much more powerful than we. Uh, but Jehoshaphat was reminded, you don't need to be afraid for the battle is not yours but God's. And then in verses 21 and 22 we read, And when he, Jehoshaphat, had taken counsel with the people, no doubt expressing to them the same encouragement that had been expressed to him, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire. And they went before the army. Now that's a strange military strategy, I would say. But it was common in the days of Israel as they went out to face their enemies. Uh, there were always those that went out to sing in preparation for battle. So Jehoshaphat appoints those who were to sing to the Lord and to praise Him. They went out before the army and they were to say this or to sing this. And it's the very thing that we've read here this morning. Give thanks to the Lord for His steadfast love endures forever. And the Bible says when they began to sing and to praise the Lord... He set an ambush against the people or the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come out against Judah and so they were routed uh, as they sang. Uh, it appears that the army never had to strike a blow. Uh, not an arrow was, was, was unleashed. Not, uh, not a single fight took place. The Lord took control of the day. And let me tell you, when we gather to sing and when we when we hear you know that's the other thing you need to hear what you're singing one of the reasons we put the words up on the screen is not because you don't know the song and you need them in order to sing but we want you to be able to read what these songs say about god we want you to be able to to hear and to see uh, and to be reminded and encouraged by all that god is and of course the scripture says here in the very first line give thanks to the lord why for he is good for he is good. Uh, I want to talk just a moment about that word good or God's goodness. Uh, that, that word good, uh, again, is a word that we apply to so many things. Uh, but in the Hebrew culture, it originally spoke of something or, or even someone who was uh, beneficial or helpful. They were good. It was good. Uh, that word was also used of, of someone or something that, that met one's needs or fulfilled one's desires. So, so again, we, we get the idea. We use the word in the same way today. Uh, but when the word began to be used of God, when, we, when men and women began to speak of God as good, uh, it took on a, a deeper significance, uh, a deeper meaning. And, and rather than just being used when used of God of something or someone who, who meets our needs, 
it began to be understood uh, as, as that which exceeds mm -hmm. uh, our desires, exceeds our expectations. Uh, I, I love that, that definition of goodness. When we, when we speak of the goodness of God, we are always speaking of the one who meets our needs in an abundant, an overabundant way, who exceeds our desires. Again, uh, Paul uh, understood this idea of God's goodness and captured it in Ephesians 3, verse 20, where he speaks of God as able, uh, again, the old King James Version, able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or even imagine, the ESV, able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think. The reality is, for the people of God, for us, that when we call upon the name of the Lord, uh, when we entrust ourselves to the goodness of God, what we can always expect is to have our expectations exceeded. God doesn't just simply meet our needs. He doesn't stingily dole out His, his blessings. Uh, but no, He gives them in abundance. He lavishes them upon us. He exceeds not only our our. Our, our plea or our request, but, but even our ability to, to think. Uh, God always does so much more. Also in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, Paul writes, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. So again, this idea that God's grace abounds to us. I know that there are times in our lives, and, and you know, the truth is, 2020 may be one of those times with all that has taken place in this year and the impact that that may have had upon you and your family. Uh, it is easy for us to begin to think that maybe God has, has withdrawn or maybe God's not paying attention or, or, or maybe God is somehow disciplining us or, or that he has somehow with, removed his, his blessing from his people. And, and we need to never allow ourselves to think those kind of thoughts. God's grace is always abounding toward us, always. Uh, whether we have a job or whether we're looking for a job or, or whether we've been without a job for a long time, whether we're able to make ends meet, God's grace is always <clears throat> abounding to us whether we are facing hardship or sickness or death or 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 the death of a loved one God's grace is always abounding toward us again so that we will have all sufficiency in all things at all times so that we may abound in every good work uh, the reality is and and again uh, our scripture clearly lays this out for us God is the one that we need to go to for the definition of, of what is good. You know, it's real important uh, for us to know what words mean. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important for us to know what words mean when we are speaking those words and when, when we're listening to others speak words. I think that's one of the big issues today uh, and why there's so much contention and division. Uh, people say things and they use words and the words that they're using mean one thing to me and something else to them. And, and so it's, it's good, beneficial, helpful if we explain what we mean by the words that we use. And the Word of God does that. This word good is, is well, it's God who defines what that word means. Uh, perhaps it would be more precise to say that God is the definition right. yeah. of good. Uh, mm -hmm. We have God's description or definition of himself in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. And there we read this. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, <clears throat> The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. So goodness, at least one aspect of goodness, is this idea of mercy and grace. Slow to anger. Well, we need a lot of that in the world today, don't we? Mm -hmm. Slowness to anger, that's, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. God is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So a constancy when it comes to loving one another, faithfulness in living this life that God has given us. Keeping steadfast love for thousands. God doesn't play favorites, does he? Mm -hmm. He loves us. He loves us all. We are to, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. 
God is the one who forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Now, when we get into that aspect of goodness, of course, we know that only God can do those things. And of course, that understanding of God, this ability to forgive iniquity and sin and transgression is what prompted Jesus uh, and the gospel writers to proclaim that God alone is good, all right? Because only God can do those things, right? Only God is perfectly gracious and merciful. Only God is slow to anger in the way that He is slow to anger. Only God is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness to the degree that He abounds in steadfast love and faithfulness. Only God can forgive iniquity and sin and transgression. God alone is good. Amen. But as you and I seek to honor the Lord, to love Him, to please Him, then we should look at His nature, His character, and, and, and as much as is humanly possible, we should apply these characteristics, seek to live them out uh, in our own life. So church, give thanks. Unite in your expression of gratitude to God here, certainly here, but always, wherever we are, because God is good. And Brother James mentioned, you know, Israel already doing this in, in 2 Chronicles. But this phrase, for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever, is a phrase they use. It's not only going to be a refrain in 107, because we're going to see it over, over again in 107. This is a refrain that Israel used all the time. God told them that's what they should sing when they're going out before war. But in 1 Chronicles 16, 34, do you remember when the Ark of the Covenant gets taken by the Philistines? Yeah. Right. And so the Ark of the Covenant's away from the Philistines and David finally goes and he gets the Ark of the Covenant and he brings it back properly and he puts it in the tent that he had created for it. All the people sing for God is good and his steadfast love endures forever. When eventually Solomon builds the temple in 2 Chronicles 5, the temple, temple is built and they take the Ark of the Covenant and they bring it into the temple for the very first time, the permanent house of God that, that Israel had built. They bring the Ark of the Covenant in and guess what they sing? For the Lord is good and His steadfast love endures forever. In, in the book of Ezra, when Israel is coming back from Babylonian captivity, which is the context of this entire uh, song here, but when they're coming back, they lay the foundation of the rebuilt temple. And as soon as they lay the foundation is, guess what they sing? For the Lord is good and His steadfast love endures forever. This is a refrain that is used over and over and over again because Israel understood something about God. Though they did not always do it perfectly, they understood something about God. Here's what they understood about God. God is good. And because God's nature is in fact good, there are going to be streams that flow from that goodness. There's going to be an action that pours out from that goodness. You can think about it like this. God's goodness is an overflowing fountain. So you just have a fountain, it's overflowing, and the streams that are going to overflow onto the ground and pour out is the love of God that is poured out in our lives. So the character of God, the goodness of the Lord, is this fountain that the streams of His love then are poured out into our lives. Israel understood this. So the nature of God is that He is good. He is a good God. We define, as Brother James just said, we define goodness by God. Whatever he does is good. And one of the major characteristics that one of the major actions that flow out of that fountain of goodness is his love. That is why they link for the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever. This phrase or this word, steadfast love, is the Hebrew word hased. And I want to talk about that just for a minute because it's a very, very important word. And you see it often in the Old Testament. It is a word that expresses the Lord's fundamental covenant relationship with his people. The word hased is the it expresses the foundational covenantal love of God for his people. The word um, is difficult to translate into English. And so depending on the context that it is used in the, in the Hebrew Bible, we translate it different ways. We can translate it steadfast love as we do here in 107. It has been translated loving kindness. It has been translated love, kindness, mercy, loyalty, favor, devotion, goodness. These are all ways that this word hased, the covenantal love of God, is expressed in the Old Testament. So, God is good by nature, 
and he has set his hased, his covenantal love on a people so those people would praise and honor and glorify his name. All right? Follow the, the train of thought with me here. The fountain of goodness, the nature of God's goodness, then flows out in covenantal love on a people, and those people in turn praise God for his goodness and his love. Now, in English, just continuing with this phrase, his steadfast love endures forever, the word endures is not there uh, in, in the original language. We, tr- we put endures in there, but really it's, uh, it should just be hased forever and ever. For the Lord is good and his hased forever and ever. Now, this means a couple things. God's covenantal love for his people has eternally existed. As long as God has been good, his covenantal hased has existed for his people, even though you didn't exist yet. So you didn't exist yet, but his covenantal love for you as his people already existed because he is eternal. His goodness has always been there as his nature. These streams have always been flowing and God creates us to then take in those streams. So in eternity past, right? The only only language we got to kind of try to express this, eternity past. In eternity past, we've got God's has said for his people. Then in the present, God has has said for his people and he will always have has said for his people. So that's why he says, for the Lord is good and his has said forever and ever. It's eternal. It is always. It is consistent. It has always been there because God has always been good. So God has always determined to act in love toward his people. He's doing it now toward the people that are alive now. He is still being faithful to those who have come before us and he will be faithful to those who come after. He will always, always act in love toward his people. Now, the primary way he acts in love toward his people is by redeeming them. The primary way that we benefit in this chesed love that is overflowing from the fountain into our lives is that we are redeemed. And that is where he goes in verse 3 when he begins talking about the redeemed of God. Yeah, and it says there, it's really verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. So that word redeemed is is used twice there in that verse. Yes, it's verse 2. Thank you for that. And... uh, (laughs) Anyway, uh, God's goodness overflows in his love to his people. And again, I love that that aspect. You know, when we read those words that his steadfast love endures forever, when we think of enduring, we think of something that that continues forever into the future. But, But we need to be reminded, as Neil did remind us, that that also implies or indicates that God's love streams forever into the past. Uh, He has always loved us. He has always determined to act in love toward us. It's a wonderful, Mm -hmm. wonderful thing. And and again, the primary way that he does that is through the redemption of his people. And I want to talk about what that word means for us today. And I'm going to talk about a little bit what it meant or the understanding of that word to the people who would sing this song in the days that it was was written. But the first thing I want to deal with is this whole idea of let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And again, just to make this simple, uh, when we read those words, the redeemed of the Lord, that's us. All right. That's us. God is speaking to us this morning. We are the redeemed of the Lord. If there has been a time in your life when you have seen yourself or realized that you are a sinner separated from God because of your sin and in repentance, you have turned from that sin <clears throat> and received or welcomed Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, into your heart and life, then God has redeemed you, all right? He has made you His own. Uh, he has purchased you, uh, as we've already talked about to a certain uh, degree earlier in, in some of our, our preaching. So we are the redeemed of God, all right? If there's any question about who that is, it's, it's us. We are those who have personally experienced the goodness of God. 
We have personally experienced God's faithfulness and love. We have personally experienced these things. We're not just people who have, who have heard about these things or read about these things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we who are among the redeemed of the Lord have personally experienced God in His goodness, His faithfulness, His love, and, and we, we know what this redemption uh, is, is all about. Therefore, the Scripture says, we should say so. In other words, what is it that we should say? Well, we should give thanks to the Lord for He's good, and that His steadfast love endures forever, that it's eternal. Well, those are the things, or the kinds of things, <clears throat> that we should be eager to verbally express, to share, uh, to proclaim, to declare, uh, again, this expression of our gratitude to God for who He is and for the things that He has done. Uh, and we are to do that not only in worship, again, which is the emphasis of this psalm, this corporate acknowledgement, this corporate expression of our appreciation to God, but we're to do it everywhere, throughout mm -hmm. the world. Uh, we're, we're to be a people who, who, who are ready, eager, uh, always on the brink of expressing our gratitude to God for all that He has done for us. Uh, and again, in times when difficulty has risen, especially in times like these, when, when difficulty has arisen across the board, in other words, this is a time in our lives when we can honestly say that the struggles that we are enduring today with the coronavirus are, are struggles that, that people throughout the world are enduring. We, we, can, we can truly identify with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We can identify with our neighbors, whether they live down the street or across town or across the country or around the world. We can identify with people in this particular trouble that we are experiencing. And it's in moments like this we ought to be eager to share the goodness of God, the greatness of God, the, the redemption that God alone brings to his people. David writes the 145th Psalm, and it's a wonderful illustration of, of what this Psalm 107 is talking about. Uh, David writes these words. Again, David was a man who had personally experienced the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. He knew the steadfast love of the Lord. Uh, we've shared that, that David, although he was the great king of Israel, David was just a man. He was a great sinner. He committed adultery and murder and tried to cover his sin. And, and it hurt him and his family and his kingdom. And, and yet God was gracious and merciful. And, and David remained a man after God's own heart. So David writes these words in the 145th Psalm. He says, I will extol you, my God and king, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day, notice the, the regularity there, every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. You know, if there's any question about the greatness of God, mm -hmm. that, that ought to come to an end this morning. God is great. He does great things. He is greatly to be praised. One generation shall commend your works to another. They shall declare all your mighty acts. Why is it important that we as God's people declare His greatness and, and express our gratitude freely, openly, eagerly? Because the next generation, your children, my children, our grandchildren, they need to hear about this great God and what He's done. David says, one generation shall commend your works to another. And he says, in all your works, all your works will give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak. Notice that word, speak. We're not just to live lives that demonstrate our gratefulness mm -hmm. to God, as important as that is. Right. We are to speak right. with our lips. Yes. We, we praise God. We thank Him yes. with our lips and with our lives. Yep. Uh, but, but with our lips, the saints shall bless you. They shall speak of your glo the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power and make known to the children of man. So not only are we responsible to the next generation of, of, of believers, all right, our children, our grandchildren, but we're, we're responsible to the people of the world. Mm -hmm. We make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. He closes that psalm. He says, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Uh, we are to be a people 
eager to verbally express and again, th this takes a lot of forms. Not only are we to share testimony of God's goodness, not only are we to be a people who thank God in public for the blessings that we enjoy each and every day, mm -hmm. not only are we to be a people who, who share uh, a, a witness with, uh, again, our children and our children's children and our neighbors, we're to talk about this great salvation that is ours. Yeah. But, but not, only, not only that speaking aspect, but again, as we sing, this ought to, to, to re-emphasize to us the importance of corporate worship, music, singing. Uh, many will be able to do exactly what David did. You know, I, I, I hope and I pray that, that from our congregation, God will raise up hymn, hymn writers, songwriters, men and women who are able to express with pen and paper the, the wondrous uh, works that God has done for us and the great God that has done these things for us. We are the redeemed of the Lord. God has redeemed us. I mean, think about that for a moment. We were slaves to our sin, lost, undone, dead in darkness. And God called us into his marvelous light. He saved us. We're, we're the redeemed of the Lord and we should have no problem eagerly expressing our gratitude to God. So we're to speak, we're to verbally express our gratitude, our thanks to God for all that he is and all that he has done. And then this whole idea of, of being the redeemed, that God has redeemed us from trouble. Again, let me tell you, before I came to know Christ, I was in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so were you. Yeah. Most people don't even realize how much trouble yeah, they're in. That's right. They, they may think they're in trouble a little bit. They're behind on their rent or they're, mm -hmm. again, they've lost their job or, or there's problems with their children who are living in rebellion uh, or, or there's division within the household. Mm -hmm. They think they're in trouble, but let me tell you, it's, it's much worse than yeah. they think. That's right. That's right. When I didn't know God, I was, I was dead mm -hmm. in my trespasses and sin. Mm -hmm. I was in trouble. So what is it as a redeemed person that I must thank God for? What trouble has he saved me from or rescued me from? You know, I, I was reading a book over the weekend <clears throat> and the book reminded me that, that one of the greatest enemies that I have in life is me. I mean, you know, if, if nothing else, we can thank God for saving us from ourselves. Amen. Amen. Uh, I mean, God does that. He, he does that for us. Mm -hmm. We tend to think of trouble as being something exterior, something from the outside. But let me tell you, we got, we got plenty of trouble without, without going there right away. Uh, yeah. but, but this is what God has done for us. And of course, the Old Testament saints who would read these words, the people of Israel, in their mind, they had this idea or this understanding of what redemption was. As a matter of fact, they even had people within their families that they referred to as redeemers, kinsmen redeemers, men who would provide a needed service to their families in times of trouble. And one of the things that these kinsmen redeemers would do is that if an individual had gotten himself into debt, boy, we, we probably need to wish we had some kinsmen redeemers today. Uh, there's so much <laughs> debt in our world. But if, a, if an Israelite got himself into debt to the point that he had lost his freedom because of that debt, or was going to lose his property because of that debt, the kinsman redeemer would pay his debt for him. Uh, again, thus relieving him uh, of that trouble. Now, what we need to do is to just kind of bring that forward to a New Testament context and think of Jesus Christ. He's our redeemer. He's our kinsman right. redeemer. And, and what Jesus Christ has done for us when we think of this Thank whole Christ. idea of being released from our debt, Jesus has paid the price for our sin. Mm -hmm. He took our sin upon himself, the Bible says, became sin for us so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. So again, the redemption that Jesus has accomplished in our life far exceeded this mm -hmm. Old Testament picture or type or shadow of the redemption that was to come in him. These Old Testament kinsmen redeemers would pay off someone's debt and thus relieve them of that burden in their lives. Jesus pays off our sin debt uh, and in its place he gives us his righteousness so he doesn't just eliminate our debt but he, he he fills us he covers us he clothes us in his righteousness uh, again through his death
on the cross. So when we think of, of being the redeemed, we have to think of this aspect of we are a people who have been released from this great debt that we could have never paid off mm -hmm. on our own. And then <clears throat> a second aspect of the kinsman's redeemer's responsibility was in the event of death. If a man died leaving his wife a widow and his children orphans, the kinsman redeemer was to step in and take care of the family, even to the point of if the woman was without children, he was to take his sister-in-law as his own wife and to bear children to carry on his brother's name. So in other words, there was this whole aspect of saving a family uh, in the event of, of death. Uh, and of course, we certainly can think of that with Jesus. And, and, and beyond that, if this brother's death had been brought about by someone, in other words, if he had been murdered or killed, the kinsman redeemer was responsible to avenge his death. He was to actually avenge, pursue this killer and eliminate him uh, in order to avenge the death uh, of, of his loved one. And again, when we bring this forward into New Testament context, that's what Jesus has done for us. Mm -hmm. but, but he's done more than avenge our death, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he's raised us from the dead. Right. Isn't that what Jesus does for us? Right. Yep. He calls us out of darkness into his yep. marvelous light. He, he gives us life or brings us to life out of the death that our sins and trespasses have brought upon us. So when we think of this aspect of redemption, we have to understand that Jesus has given us life. He has literally raised us from the dead. Uh, and we are as certain uh, to, again, for the ultimate resurrection. One day our bodies will be resurrected from the grave. And why Amen. do I know that? Well, because Jesus' Amen. body was resurrected right. from the grave. That's right. Why do I know that one day I will take my place in the very presence of God mm -hmm. in heaven or upon the new earth? Because Jesus, Jesus has taken his place yeah, there right. at the right hand that's right. of the Father. So Jesus right. has, has not simply avenged our deaths. He mm -hmm. has raised us from the dead. And of that's course, good. again, this, this whole idea of rescuing this family in the, as a result of the death of their provider and protector, Jesus does the same thing for us. He rescues us from destruction. Uh, you know, we like to think of ourselves as independent, you know, uh, People who provide, especially we men, we like to think of ourselves as, as those who are able to provide and protect uh, our families. Uh, let me tell you, uh, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. And we need to remember that. Everything that God has done for us, every ability that God has given us to, to gain wealth, as we talked about last week, comes from God. Uh, the, the opportunities that God presents to us to provide for our families, to protect our families. These are blessings from God. All of these things God has done in and through the redemption. He has released us from our sin debt. He has raised us from the dead. And he is rescuing us every moment from destruction and will rescue us ultimately uh, from ourselves and from every enemy that confronts us now. Uh, and forever. And I hope you're seeing that the love of God does stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right? See, because we think of human love, I throw my love out there and I hope, I hope someone will accept my love. Right? right? You, you, you have this love for someone and you hope it's just re received and reciprocated back to you. But see, that's not how God's love works. God's love, when it is sent out and set upon people, it actually does what God is setting it out to do. It accomplishes things. Amen. My love doesn't necessarily do that, but God's love does. So this redemption that is happening is happening because God has set his said upon us, his covenantal love upon us, and that covenantal love does something to us. One of the things that it does in verse 3, in ver it's, it is, is verse, verse, three. It's verse 3, Brother James, it gathers up God's people. Now, I want to say four things real quick about this gathered people. All right, this is very important because here's what it says. And gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. So the very first thing, these gathered people, the gathered, are from the whole earth. Right. So these redeemed people, these people who have the Hased, steadfast love of God set upon them are from the entire 
world. Now, the direct context of this is the gathering of Israel who had been dispersed because of the Babylonian attack. Babylon attacks Israel. God's people are dispersed. Some went to Egypt. Some were killed. Some were taken into Babylonian captivity. So there was this dispersion that happened. Now God is, God is gathering them back up. But the larger context that we've been dealing with this morning is the application of the redeemed of God through Jesus Christ. And in fact, Jesus alludes to this idea of gathering from the north and the south and the east from the west. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, he says this, And he will send out his messengers with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, north, the south, the east, and the west, from one end of heaven to the other. So we know that this redemption, gathering through the gospel of Jesus Christ, is gathering up a people from all over the world. It is gathering up the people that God put his hased on from the four winds, from the whole earth. L listen to Revelation chapter 7. And then I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. So in the end, on the new earth, there are going to be a gathered people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every people on the earth are being gathered. Now, now listen, Christianity is different in this way than every other religion. Have you ever noticed that every other religion is usually linked to an ethnicity? Right? When you think of Islam, there's an there's a, there's a ethnicity that's linked to that. Buddhism, there's an ethnicity that's linked to that. Hinduism, there's an ethnicity that's linked to that. Christianity, there... Wait. It's people from all over the world. It's, it's people from every language, every tribe, every tongue. It's, it's people from all over the world that were believing in Jesus. It's different. It's unique in that aspect because God is gathering up these people from all over the world. Number two, these gathered people are not just gathered from all over the world, but they're gathered together in unity. Israel has spread. They've been divided in, in many ways. And now God is bringing them back together in oneness, in unity, back to Jerusalem, back into one city. And the people of God all over the world, are being brought back together in Christ. We have many things that could divide us, don't we? The church of Jesus Christ has many things that could work to divide us. Yep. Think about it, all over the world. We, we have, we're from different nations, different cultures, different languages. All these things that could divide us. I've had the privilege of going on mission trips to other countries I got to go to the Philippines when I was 19 years old. I did not understand the culture. I did not understand the language. And I was in a different nation. Everything was very, very different. Very different. But do you know what? The only time that I felt really comfortable in the Philippines was when, was I, when I was with the Filipino Christians. All of a sudden, then I was like, I, I kind of feel at home with these people. Mm -hmm. I don't speak their language. I, I don't live in their nation. This, but there, there's this thing that is uniting us together. And it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even though we are so different, all these things could divide us. There was a love that we had for one another that could not be explained. I've experienced the same thing when I go to Mexico. We go to Mexico and, and, and it's a different culture and I don't speak the language and I don't understand everything that they do and how they do it. But what happens is, is that when I'm around my brothers and sisters in Christ who live in Mexico or live in the Philippines, some have gone to the Czech Republic from here, there's a, there's a oneness that we cannot... Who can do that but God? Right. Who can do that but God? Take people that should not be in unity and bring us together. Only God can do something like that. Amen. Only God can do this. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, there is one body and there is one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And I know we've, we've spoken about this here before, but, but regardless of your political affiliation, your brothers and sisters in Christ who may not agree with you politically, you are one with them. That's right. And your political allegiance cannot, you cannot erect a wall up that should not be erected. And your allegiance to the body of Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, it, it wipes out all of those things and we're united together 
as believers in Jesus Christ. And that's the way it should be done. Number three, the gathered do not have their lives together. Okay? The gathered do not have their lives together. Now, we can look at, at examples in the rest of this chapter, and as we work through this, you're going to see it. But I just want to let you know, the people that God gathers here together are not people that are righteous and holy and good. In fact, God calls them a bunch of different things in Psalm 107, but they are those who wander, sat in darkness, rebels, fools, sinful, and evil. But they all have one thing in common in Psalm 107. They cried out to the Lord. Yep. Jesus did not come to save the righteous. That's right. He did not come to save the holy. He came to save the sinners and the fools and the rebels. Jesus says in, in Matthew 2, 17, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick. Right. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. All of these people, and the truth is, every redeemed person through the gospel of Jesus Christ. They didn't have their act together when God redeemed them. Might I say as a side note, we ain't got our act together now either, do we? Like we're trying, we're headed, we're being sanctified, but let's just be real. Isn't it good to know that God is doing this work in us of gathering? That God is the one who reached out to us in our sinful, rebellious, foolish nonsense, the trouble that we were in, and He gathers us up Together, God came to save sinners, not those who think themselves righteous, those who know they are not righteous, those who know they are not holy. Number four, the gathered are given love for the Lord. When God redeems the sinners and gathers His people by His love, He changes them and gives them a love for Himself. That is why all of these people in Psalm 107, they are satisfied, they are freed, they are joyful, they are full of praise because now God has given them a love for Himself. Now they love the Lord. This is what salvation is all about. Giving the, the people of God a love for Himself so that now those people praise and give thanks to His name. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace. Did you, did you catch that? Why were we saved? To the praise of His glorious grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to all the things in Him. Things in heaven, oh, sorry, purpose for which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Jesus Christ might be to the praise of his glory. We have been gathered, united given a love for God so that we would praise Him. Amen. You want to say, if, if you want to say, first off, why did God save human beings? So that He would be glorified. For His glory. So that He would be praised. So that He would be exalted. So these four things about the gathering here, they're gathered from the whole earth. They're gathered in unity. They're given a, a, a love for God. They didn't have it all together. God saved them and brought them in. And I want to end with this this morning. I want to add one more thing that I think will be a, a capper to everything we've talked about this morning. The redemption, the gathering, and the restoration of God's people includes the people eternally praising His name. In other words, what I mean by that is you cannot separate praise and thanksgiving to Jesus from the restoration and the gathering. Sinners who do not have their act together, but have been called from all over the world, given love to Jesus and been united 
it has been done in order to praise God. The fullness of the restoration includes the praising. So when Brother James says, the redeemed of the Lord should say so, well, absolutely we should say so. And I would also add, we will say so. Because the restoration includes the praising and glorying of Jesus. There's not going to be a restoration at a gathering that does not include those gathering people praising Jesus for His goodness and His steadfast love. They go together. The restoration includes the praising. Our worship, our joy, our gladness in Jesus is not complete unless we praise Him. Your joy is not complete until you express that joy to God in praise. Your gladness is not complete until you express that to Him. C.S. Lewis talked about this. And let me give you a quote he said. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is an appointed consummation. And he gives us some examples. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is, is incomplete until it is expressed. It is frustrating to have discovered a new author and to not be able to tell anyone how good she is. If I read a book and that book's great, guess what? I'm going to tell some people about how great that book was because that praising of the book is completing the enjoyment of it. If I just read a book and go, wow, that was great. It's not complete, is it? But when I read it and I go home and I'm like, let me tell you this book I'm reading all about. And my family goes, oh my gosh. And I'm like, no, you got to understand. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's a wonderful book. You got you to see it. Or he says, when you, when you uh, go and you suddenly come at a turn on the road upon some mountainous valley of unexpected grandeur, and then to have to keep silent because the people who you are with do not care about it, any more than a tin can in a ditch. That would be so frustrating. You come around a turn and here's this beautiful landscape with mountains. It's the most glorious thing you've ever seen. And you got to keep silent because no one else in the car cares. Your enjoyment of that is not complete until you say, wow, look at that. Is that not glorious and beautiful and wonderful? Wow. Or to hear a good joke and find no one to share it with. He's making a point, though, a much larger point. Your enjoyment, your satisfaction, your love for Jesus is not complete until you express it. It's not complete until you praise. It's not complete until you give thanks. That's the consummation of the whole point. God is gathering. He's bringing people in from all over the world. He's uniting us together when things should be dividing us. And he brings us together for what purpose? So that we can be redeemed and we can praise Jesus for the redemption. Amen. And that's what we will do forever and ever. It is the end in which you have been created. And it is the end in which we have been recreated. Amen. So that when Jesus comes back on the new earth, people from every tribe, every language, every tongue, every nation, these redeemed people will say God is good, His steadfast love endures forever, and we will worship Him in the perfect consummation of that redemption forever. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And guess what, church? We're not just supposed to kick back and sit back and wait for the, the new earth. The new earth's already started, has it not? Mm -hmm. It has already begun in us. So let's start it now. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you and I thank you, God, for the opportunity for Brother James and I to dig into this passage, Lord. I pray that it has been an encouragement to our people. I, I pray that it has been an exhortation to our people. I hope that, Lord, this would be something that we think about all week, that we would contemplate the goodness and the steadfast love of God and that we would think about how we are to be a people, a redeemed people that uh, praise Him for who uh, He is, who You are, Father. Uh, Holy Spirit, infuse in us an energy, a passion, a devotion, and a, an exuberation to express our praise and our thanks and our love for You. 
We love you, God. Thank you for being able to gather together as a people this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.